and we will address them later. Okay. Thank you very much, um, uh, Tracy and Linda, for that introduction. Um, it's great to be able to uh, present this, this information uh, for you today. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, thank you very much, uh, as I say, to Tracy and Linda for um, or, uh, organizing this and for inviting me to present this information. And it is, as uh, Linda has just mentioned, very nice to be able to talk more about my day job because it has been very much consumed uh, over the past couple of years with um, with the COVID-19 issues related to, to food um, safety in the food industry. So yeah, so we're gonna have a look at uh, an overview of foodborne viruses uh, today. Uh, what we're going to cover is the, the, the viruses which are an issue in the food industry. Uh, a brief look at how viruses differ from bacteria, which is important when you're trying to look at control measures. We're going to have a look at uh, the transmission through the food supply chain. So how the, uh, the viruses uh, are transmitted right through from uh, production right through to retail. Should the food industry be concerned about viruses? It's a question that we should all be uh, considering. Some information on outbreaks and things that we can do to test uh, and, and control viruses, perhaps. So the viruses of main concern to the food industry. Let's just briefly go through these uh, one at a time. So probably the main one that you uh, have all heard of um, is norovirus and the two main genogroups um, that uh, affect humans are genogroup one and two. Now we do have a rapid onset of uh, symptoms for norovirus. I don't know if you've ever had norovirus yourself, but I have, and it does happen very quickly. So if you've consumed something that uh, uh, perhaps a day or two ago, you, you could uh, get symptoms very quickly, perhaps within 12 hours to 48 hours. But interestingly, it can commonly present as asymptomatic infection. So you may not always uh, know that you've actually uh, got uh, this um, infection. And that can be a problem, especially in the food industry. You may experience vomiting, diarrhea, or perhaps both abdominal pain, fever, nausea, headaches, and dehydration, of course, is very um, common because you're losing so much liquid. And that can be especially dangerous for the young and the elderly. But the good news is, if you can call it, that is it's self-limiting. It lasts a relatively short time for 24 to 72 hours. Um, so it doesn't last too long and it can be shed in very large quantities though. So um, typically more than uh, a thousand million particles per gram can be shed when you have this infection. And genogroup two is the one that is most associated with human gastroenteritis. So in terms of hepatitis A virus, this is quite different from norovirus because the incubation period lasts for about two to six weeks. So you may not get any symptoms for up to maybe 50 days. That makes it a little bit more difficult when you're trying to remember what you may have eaten um, with regards to uh, you know, thinking about tracing back and what you might have eaten to have hepatitis A virus. You, if you are unlucky enough to catch this, you may experience jaundice, abdominal pain, fever, nausea, and vomiting. And it may end up with acute liver failure in the elderly. The difference between this and norovirus is it can last for many weeks or months, the illness. Uh, I know a couple of people who have had this and it's maybe taken them up to six months to feel better at the end of it. Um, but most people will get over it if they, if they do catch it. Genogroups groups one, two, and three are associated with human illness. The good news is that there is a, a vaccination available um, for a hepatitis A virus. A lot of people get it when they uh, wish to travel abroad. Um, and also, uh, you know, there is a push, especially in the United States, in the United States, where there is a big problem with hepatitis A virus, there's a big push to get all food handlers uh, vaccinated against hepatitis A. 
Um, not sure how practical that is and, and how, if that would ever happen um, in here or Europe, but uh, um, that's certainly something that they're discussing in great detail. Hepatitis E virus is perhaps one of the um, least known with regards to foodborne viruses. Uh, if you um, are unlucky to catch hepatitis E, it's very similar symptoms to hepatitis A virus. So incubation period is two to eight weeks, similar sort of symptoms. There is a higher mortality rate um, in pregnant women, and that's mainly with genotypes one and two, and that's associated with human illness in Asia and Africa. But there are types of hepatitis E that can infect both animals and humans. And genotype three is the one that can be found worldwide, including Europe, and genotype four is associated with uh, some zoonotic cluster cases uh, in China and Japan. So the most common foods associated with uh, outbreaks of norovirus and hepatitis A, these are mainly things which have not had any kind of heat treatment. So it will be things like fresh and frozen produce. And that might include things like salad vegetables, which are eaten raw, for example, open headed lettuce, spinach, other salad vegetables, other leafy greens, uh, which, um, which you may eat uh, raw. And we have also had issues with berry fruits, for example, strawberries, raspberries, blueberries. Again, things which don't tend to have any control measures put on in regards to processing at all before they are sold and consumed. And as far as hepatitis E is concerned, well, there are seven different genotypes of hepatitis E currently classified. Hepatitis E uh, genotypes one to seven. One and two are actually endemic and infect just humans. Three and four are also endemic and they've been isolated from pigs, wild boars, many other types of um, small animals as well, including game. Um, and they are zoonotic, so they can infect both animals and humans. So common and mostly responsible for human infections is uh, genotype three. There are two other um, types. So five and six um, have been isolated from wild boars. And more recently, uh, genotype seven, which has been recently detected in dromedary camels. So really, it is a global public health issue that involves not only humans, but animals and the environment as well. And we really um, were alerted to this issue uh, by Public Health England at the time, or UKHSA now. But um, the, uh, the problem was where um, they found that um, from about 2010, there was a marked increase in the number of cases of hepatitis E. And these weren't related to travel. Normally hepatitis E cases are related to travel to areas where it's endemic and maybe it's in uh, water, which is contaminated. But these ones were found not to be travel related and indigenous uh, to the UK. So where did these come from? Well, two thirds of the virus found in humans is a particular clade of um, genotype three, type three C. But they did find that hepatitis uh, E virus, um, genotype three clade E was virus found in British pigs. So they weren't quite sure why um, that was the case. Um, and we know that UK pigs, pigs are viremic at the time of slaughter and may contribute to infections, but not the majority. So where are these uh, three C viruses coming from? So they, um, they found a link uh, there and the, the national and linked European data was found to be very important. It is the most common cause of hepatitis worldwide, interestingly, and there are over 56,000 deaths per year. That's obviously not all contributed to foodborne, but um, uh, mostly person to person. Um, and many are asymptomatic, but can pass it on to others, obviously. The detection technologies, though, um, rely on molecular testing techniques. So it's looking at the genetic material. So we don't see any indication of infectivity. But if there is no heat treatment of the product, then 
more risk is obviously involved. Raw pig liver is um, a product uh, which is commonly associated with um, potentially having uh, contamination by hepatitis E virus. Interestingly, a case control study in France a few years ago found that raw pork liver sausage was a risk factor. I think it's called figatelu. Other meat types, of course, include salamis and other fermented pork products where there's no heat treatment involved. These could be a risk also, but there's no huge amount of data on the prevalence of hepatitis E virus in fermented foods uh, on a global scale. Because you cannot, um, you can only look at this um, or detect it currently um, using molecular detection techniques, um, there really is a, a need for a reliable infectivity assay. And there's a, I know there's a lot of work being done by various individual laboratories to produce an infectivity assay that's um, robust and reliable. However, um, there is no actual international standard method for any infectivity assay as yet, as is the case for a molecular detection assay. Lots of work, as I say, is going on in relation to this uh, around various labs around the world. Thankfully, there is a new ISO working group that's been set up to develop a detection method for hepatitis E virus. I'm a member of that, and along with a couple of other colleagues from the UK, and there's probably about um, another 20 colleagues um, from around the world that's also involved in that new ISO working group. So watch this space for more information about that as that progresses, but it, it, that's literally just started. So it, it's really important to just note quickly how viruses differ from bacteria, because a lot of um, control measures obviously are related to purely to how to control bacteria. So some of the features um, include, well, they can't reproduce like bacteria can outside of a host cell. The virus needs to be able to uh, be consumed by the human and go into the particular host cell where it will then use the cell's um, structures to um, replicate itself and then burst the cell open and viruses are released and move into the other cells and, and so on. That's very different from how bacteria reproduce which don't rely on a host cell. They can remain infectious through the freezing process. This is indeed how they are stored in the laboratory. And they can be transmitted by foods. So basically foods can carry these viruses quite happily. And they can remain infectious for a considerable amount of time without any obvious signs of degradation to the food. So unlike spoilage bacteria that you won't see any difference to the taste or smell of the food. So yeah, so you can view foods really as a vehicle um, and it's not necessarily always just, uh, you know, um, raw foods. It can be transferred by humans onto any food that's consumed that doesn't get any further heat treatment. So um, baked foods, um, cooked foods, and can also be a problem if it's been post-contamination after the cooking. They are of course very small, 25 to 40 nanometers in size normally, around about 100 the size of bacteria. And very small numbers it needs to be take to actually cause something like norovirus infection in a healthy individual. Probably about 18 is a, is a rough estimate. 18 to 1,000 is um, a more conservative estimate. And it may take many more bacteria to call, cause illness um, uh, to, uh, to a human. So just this little um, uh, point here, there's a very small amount, as we've just said, of norovirus can make you sick. An interesting way of looking at it is though, if you had a look at the head of a pin and you had um, uh, the, the number of particles that you fit in the head of a pin, that would be enough to infect more than a thousand people. So you just imagine that it doesn't take much um, to have that much in your hands um, to then go on and infect uh, other things, other surfaces, foods, etc. And there is a lack of robust cell culture systems. At the moment, there isn't uh, a widely available, um, reliable method of 
culturing norovirus. There is one for hepatitis A, but it takes a long time. Um, and hepatitis C as well, there are culture systems available, but it's not a good method of um, detecting viruses. Uh, but it is a good way of being able to um, see how control strategies may, may work on viruses. So things like heat, pH, because you can't propagate these viruses on agar plates like bacteria, these are a lot more difficult characteristics to be able to, to study. So until we get reliable cell culture systems in place, these are really difficult things uh, to be able to study. So there's definitely lack of, lack of knowledge uh, with a lot of these things. But I'll be going on to see to show you how um, other methods that you can use. So routes of transmission, how do they get from humans into our food supply chain or pigs for that matter? Well, for norovirus and hepatitis A, the host in this case is the human. So where does it go? Well, of course, we excrete it through stools and if we have an infection, potentially vomit. Not a nice subject to talk about necessarily, but necessary to be able to understand how this gets into the, into the chain. So if we, are, if we have an infection, um, we don't necessarily clean our hands properly. You know, it's very difficult if we've got this situation going on. If we have contaminated hands, these can contaminate surfaces, toilet doors, handles, and then from there, everyone else who touches these things, if they're not clean very regularly, can go on to contaminate other things. And of course, um, our waste goes into sewage treatment, which doesn't necessarily have any effect on the viruses. Goes into the sea, into river courses, into groundwater, recreational waters, etc. This can also then end up as irrigation water, pesticide preparation water. Goes onto vegetables, fruits. If it goes into the sea, it can go into shellfish harvesting areas. Food handlers' hands then become a problem. Food surfaces, food preparation surfaces, even cooked foods, as, as I mentioned before, there has been outbreaks of uh, hepatitis A found in the US on, on things like donuts. Um, so there, there has been um, associated with just handling, as I say, of cooked foods as well. On this other side, we have um, issues where, of course, it goes from person to person. So if you have an infection, it can create aerosols, go in your hands, into your clothes. That can end up as mainly person to person issues then. Family members, uh, your co-workers, nurseries, care homes, hospitals is a big problem, food handlers, restaurant areas. All these areas can become contaminated fairly easily when there's a norovirus outbreak. So when we're talking about fresh produce, we're mainly talking about leafy green vegetables and soft very soft berry fruits. The virus can be transferred, as I've already mentioned, via handlers' hands. Potentially irrigate, irrigation water, pesticide preparation water, and very often farms don't really have adequate toilet facilities. You'll see this picture in the bottom right here. This is a picture of a, um, a little portaloo on a farm where there was lots of um, uh, harvesting um, personnel. And I did notice that um, that particular one didn't have any water left in the, in the hand wash area. So, you know, when people go to use these facilities and lots of people use them, they're going to pick vegetables or, or fruits. They're basically going into punnets and then sold directly to the consumer. So that's definitely a potential contamination route. Foodborne viruses and fresh produce, um, as I've mentioned already, fresh produce is unlikely to have had any heat process. They're mainly eaten raw, especially when you think about fragile fruits like strawberries or raspberries. You know, they don't go through any um, process of washing uh, by the farms or any, um, anything like that because it will damage them. Detection of low numbers of viruses directly from the foods is therefore required because they're not infecting the foods. They're not replicating on the foods. So we have to be able to, as, as um, 
as the researchers or scientists who, or analysts who look for these viruses and foods, we have to be able to detect them directly from these foods. As I've mentioned already, there is no obvious deterioration of the food. There's no replication in the surface of the food. It will not impair the look or smell of the food. And it's not likely to be homogeneous contamination either. Unless, of course, it's something like pesticide preparation water that's potentially been uh, had uh, water that's been contaminated with norovirus, and then you've got a nice even spray of it over your product. For hepatitis C, it's slightly different, of course. The, the main host there is, is pigs. Um, in, in fact, in the UK, uh, around about 90% of the pig population is endemic with hepatitis C and similar figures around Europe as well. So of course the waste goes into runoff from the farms. It can um, go into water courses, it can go into groundwater. And if that happens to be sprayed onto fields, there is the potential for hepatitis E to contaminate fresh produce. And there has been some studies where hepatitis E has actually been found on berries. Also, um, those who deal directly with, uh, with pig herds, direct contact, obviously, you're at more of a risk. And then, of course, there's the consumption of undercooked pork products. And that's probably the main one that is of concern to the food industry and certainly the pork industry. If you think of uh, raw liver, uh, it's mainly in, in the blood and the feces of the, of the pigs. So if that goes into the food chain untreated, and it's consumed, that is where the problems may start. Other routes of transmission, we've mentioned aerosolization. Aerosolization can be a particular problem because obviously um, vomitus uh, is, a, is an issue because you're shedding it in such large numbers. And, you know, if, Again, not a pleasant subject to talk about, but if you've ever had it, um, it you know, it, it will produce projectile vomiting. Um, PHE did do a, a study um, with this. Uh, this is uh, not just here for visual effect. <laughs> um, this is called Vomiting Larry, and it's a, a, an experiment set up to show how far um, the virus can travel in one of these um, events. And they found that it was about um, 25 feet in diameter where droplets uh, were, were spread. They used fluorescent material to check this. Um, so yeah, it, it can travel a long way and that doesn't take into consideration, of course, any uh, airflow issues within where you are. So if that happened, for example, in a supermarket or a restaurant, you can imagine the effects it's had. There's been several papers um, written on the effects of aerosolization of viruses in and in outbreak situations uh, in these very areas. Um, there's several um, out there that you can read up on um, in restaurant case studies, also on, on aeroplanes as well. And not many places to escape to uh, in, in these areas when this happens. And virus particles might remain infectious for many days, possibly weeks, depending on the location. So, so deep cleaning these areas is very important. Um, when this kind of thing happens. So the big question, should the food industry be concerned about viruses? Is that an obvious question, an obvious answer to the question? Well, yes, they should be. Many are concerned about foodborne viruses. Most of the large retailers and producers are actually very knowledgeable about uh, the issues posed um, from foodborne viruses to their food supply chains. The problem is that some take action and some don't. I know that there are many producers of higher risk foods such as salad vegetables that have never even considered viruses as a risk. It's not even on the radar. They're looking at bacterial contamination or chemical contamination or packaging contamination, this kind of thing. Viruses, even although we, uh, we know a lot about them, there's been lots of data out there, there's lot, been lots of papers published, it's still not as high a priority as bacteria. So what's the conclusion in terms of food safety? 
what we should be asking ourselves is, am I producing or selling a food that is as safe as possible? Bearing in mind that no one can guarantee 100% safe food. What is safe food? Safe food is recognizing the hazards posed by various contaminants, including pathogens, obviously the bacteria, but also viruses. So what is the kind of conversations that go on in food industry? I don't know, I'm not in food industry as such, I'm not in one of these companies, but um, is there a hope that procedures that are already in place are good enough to combat the risks from viruses? There isn't any regulation when I mentioned that at the start. Even after all this time and all the data that we have, there's no regulatory requirement for testing for viruses. So is there no need to test for them? Viruses we know are a risk, but you know, let's only take action if we have a problem. So a lot of the, um, the issues that we see um, are related to outbreaks. It's reactive, not proactive. Maybe the, the feeling is it's enough to do with current regulations. Already companies have lots to do, lots of money to spend on uh, other issues. And then there's a the question of, am I opening Pandora's box by starting to look? Once you start to look, you know, the, the big thing is, if you don't look, you won't find it. You know, that's obvious. And I'm sure if some bacteria, um, you know, that are currently on legislation uh, weren't needed to be looked for, they might not also be looked for either. But they are, um, and they cause problems. We know they cause problems, and there is a, a need for them, for the food industry to look for them. The question is, we, uh, um, why aren't we also looking for viruses? Because this causes major problems as well. So on the other side of the coin, an outbreak scenario could occur. Is that any better? A recall of products, if it's not too late, and that means major costs involved. It's not a good thing for the company. There's a lot, loss of reputation. There can be media involvement, lawsuits, lots of troubles ahead um, if this occurs. And then there's also the future concern from consumers. I've put this up on the right here um, because this was um, a big one that happened um, uh, back in, um, I think it was 2018. Uh, but I'll talk about that a little bit more, but it's just an example of, of something that can happen. So what did the regulators um, know about the, the risks um, of neurovirus? The Food Standards Agency in the UK um, recently um, released a report on the detrimental effect to society of the top 13 pathogens in the UK. And this is a table that, um, an extract of a table. In fact, if I'd really encourage you to have a look at this um, document, the, the link is here. And there's very, lots of very interesting tables, but I've just chosen this one. This is a performance matrix showing the data for all six criteria. So this is um, looking at the estimated number of annual cases, the quality adjusted life years, public concern, the total cost to society, estimated number of annual fatalities, and the confidence they have in the, in the scientific knowledge of, um, of that particular organism. So you, you will see the, the main ones I'm sure you're all aware of. Campylobacter is up there, uh, perfringens, E. coli 157, listeria. This one is currently probably the highest on a lot of people's um, radar because looking at the annual number of cases compared to the number of fatalities, it's a very high death rate. So obviously there's much concern about this. So you look at all these others and eventually you'll get down here to the viruses. I did mention other viruses, um, obviously are a concern to the food industry, but um, I'm just focused on, on the three main ones. But adenovirus, astrovirus, rotavirus and sapovirus are other ones which cause issues. But just have a look at norovirus, the figures here. Annual number of cases, 383,000. The total cost to society over 1.6 billion pounds in the UK. 
the annual number of fatalities, 56. It's a moderate scientist confidence and the public concern is high. So, you know, it's, um, it, it's interesting reading and you will find that norovirus um, has been highlighted in this report several times as the number one concern. Um, and in fact, even categorized it almost as a, a category all on its own because it, 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 it ranked so high in all of the, the studies that they did. Another recent study that I was involved in as well was the, the NOVA study, the Norovirus Attribution Study. Um, that was, um, that was uh, uh, reported on by the FSA um, back in 2019. And this is where this figure of 380,000 came from. Interestingly, um, as, as well as, of course, being linked to uh, frozen raspberries and fresh raspberries, 30% uh, of these cases were linked to open head lettuce on retail sale. Not forgetting, of course, that hepatitis A virus has also been implicated in many large foodborne outbreaks throughout various parts of the UK. Most have been linked to frozen berry fruits, but more recently there has been cases um, linked to the consumption of dates as well. So things to think about. Many outbreaks have occurred internationally and nationally, some very high profile. In terms of norovirus, for example, we know that there's a huge amount of underreporting of illness. You know, if you, if you have norovirus, if you call your doctor, you're not encouraged to go back, to go into your doctor for obvious reasons. Um, therefore, it's probably never going to be diagnosed, um, self-diagnosed. And so, yeah, the, the case numbers are probably way more than the official numbers. In these times that we're living in, cost of living going up. Everyone's squeezed financially. I mean, it was a problem before, but many in the food industry are quite low paid um, and many may work when they are ill if no sick pay is offered. That's a problem for the food industry. You don't want people who are working with norovirus illness. I mean, it may happen anyway because a lot are asymptomatic, but this is the, this is the situation. No regulations are in place requiring, requiring monitoring for viruses. Yet, as we have seen, the data shows that norovirus causes the highest burden to society. Many of the illnesses are short-lived, um, especially for norovirus. Recovery is quick in most cases, but there are some cases where people get really sick due to underlying health issues. Complications can occur and deaths obviously do occur as well with all three. All the viruses can cause fatalities, they're just not as common as the other bacteria, such as Listeria. Many cases can be asymptomatic, as I've said, meaning people could be spreading the infection without knowing. So that can be a problem both in your workforce, person to person, and also if you're working in a, in a premises that handles food, that can be a problem where it can be spread to the, the food surface as well. So, Thinking about all this information that we've already um, discussed here, how can we fit all these pieces together? Where is all the contamination coming from? Well, we have um, already mentioned contaminated irrigation water um, and food handlers' hands. But thinking about contaminated irrigation water, why might that be a problem? Well, you may well have, um, well, if you're in the UK, you may well have heard of um, recently the problem with pollution in the rivers and I believe there was a, um, a headline which stated that all rivers in the, U in the UK, especially well, in England certainly, um, have pollution problems. Now this is a, um, a report which was um, uh, came out on the 5th of January this year. That again is very interesting reading. Uh, this is trying just to put two and two together here. Why, why are we having potential issues with norovirus to this extent? When we think of um, the, the pollution issue, um, they have 
this is just a few um, excerpts from this, not necessarily in context, but I've just highlighted them just to show you a few figures here. Data from the monitoring um, of sewage spills from storm overflows and wastewaters has begun to show how raw sewage mixed with rainwater or partially treated sewage is released into rivers hundreds of thousands of times a year. So that's raw sewage or partially treated going in. Now, the Environment Agency is responsible for ensuring that um, farming rules for um, use of uh, and storage of water and animal waste and slurry, um, they can actually take enforcement um, and prosecute if breaches are in place and fixed penalties um, can be issued. But th they've got a problem. They um, state here because of the reduction in their grant and because most farming isn't regulated, and therefore they don't get income from the cost of regulating farms in those cases, they've been able to do fewer and fewer farm inspections. Right now, they say at least last year, they had sufficient resource that would allow us in theory to visit every farm in Britain less than once every 200 years. Yeah, so as, it, as they admit, that's not a great disincentive to a farmer to stay on the right side of the line. So the issue there is resourcing, clearly, and the overall regulatory framework for farming. So how often are uh, stored waters um, looked, looked at in terms of viruses? That's the question. Um, another very interesting um, uh, report that's out there just recently from 2020 is this irrigation water strategy for UK agriculture and horticulture. So I was just trying to find out, you know, if we think that irrigation or is a, is a problem, how much irrigation actually occurs in the UK anyway. Um, so for outdoor field crops, this is again is just some uh, highlights I've, I've taken from this report. Most irrigation is used to supplement rainfall in potatoes and outdoor field vegetables such as carrots, onions, parsnips, and salad crops. Some water is used on soft fruits, for example, strawberries, and on other fruits, for example, orchard fruits. And most irrigation water is abstracted from surface water. So here we're talking about rivers, ponds, lakes, etc. the very ones that are being uh, polluted on a regular basis with the remainder from public water supply, ponds and harvested rainwater. Abstraction is seasonal. 68% is occurring between June and August, and a third of it is abstracted during the winter months. And bear in mind, the winter months is when we have the most stormy weather and when it's most likely that sewage overflows will occur into the river. And these are stored in farm reservoirs ready for use in the summer. It'd be really interesting to know the prevalence of viruses in these reservoirs. So that's just, you know, something to think about. I'm not saying that uh, this is a, a proven thing, but it is certainly something that we need to consider when we're trying to fit all these pieces together. So why is it that fresh produce is so prone to contamination? Well, we we'll really have to start zooming in, if you like, into the structure of these um, fruits and salad vegetables. As we've already mentioned, a lot of fresh produce is supplied unwashed. Delicate fruits, especially, are not supplied washed. And these have co complex surfaces. I mean, we have here images of um, a strawberry seed and the surface of a uh, golden raspberry surface here. Um, I've made these, obviously, obviously <laughs> this isn't to scale. I've just put these so you can actually see where viruses could end up. But actually, in real terms, the size of a virus is probably about a full stop in terms of the, the size of these Im images here. So these microscopic structures um, are important. Viruses have a very strong electrostatic bond once they attach to the surfaces of, of these um, fruits and vegetables. Um, so obviously these structures play a significant role in the attachment and subsequent difficulty in removal. So we, as you can imagine, washing these with tap water, you know, if they're such small things and all these nooks and crannies, probably not sufficient to remove viruses, just large debris. 
So we've talked about um, the theoretical roots of, of transmission of, of these viruses, but do they cause problems? Yes, they do. I mean, obviously there, there's lots of examples of outbreaks. I'm just gonna highlight a couple of note, some historical. The, probably the, the, the biggest one that, uh, that we know of occurred in, in Germany in 2012, um, related to norovirus. This was the largest recorded foodborne outbreak caused by norovirus. This happened in Germany, um, where 390 institutions across five federal states reported around about 11,000 cases of gastroenteritis. And it was mostly um, in, in schools, um, in school dinners. The cause was found to be frozen strawberries imported from China. Now, the, uh, the problem that they had here was a lot of these strawberries were going into uh, compots. They weren't heat treated before they went in, um, and there was found to be contamination in one of the lots. Now, the lot sizes here we're talking are about 20 to 24 ton lot sizes from China. Obviously, um, this didn't come from one source, came from a large distribution area. And that's why the cause of contamination will probably never be known. It's almost impossible to know where, you know, to dig down and find out where the root of contamination started there. Um, because hundreds of farms across China probably, um, you know, supplied that particular lot. But as a result of that, an EU mandate to test 5% of imported Chinese strawberries was put in place. This is the one I mentioned earlier. Uh, this one happened in a restaurant. Um, this was actually a MasterChef winner, Mexican restaurant chain Oaxaca. Um, Thomasina Myers was um, the, the winner of that um, MasterChef uh, back then. And she opened that chain of restaurants um, across Britain. They um, had about 160 customers and 200 staff becoming ill with 18 out of the 25 restaurants hit with nine forced to close temporarily. The problem was for them that um, you know, there were some individuals who had underlying health problems and the lawyers had to secure payments in excess, in excess of 15,000 for those left seriously ill um, I, I don't have any follow-up data to what happened with these people or, um, you know, follow up on this, but um, I do know that this was linked to a new menu tasting. So, um, as you can imagine, everything was prepared in one restaurant and sent out to all the different restaurants, and it was possibly from an ingredient sourced outside the EU. So that's why it had such a, a large impact. Yeah, but they lost almost £5 million after that outbreak, um, and they learnt a very um, strong lesson um, from that. And I know that they found it very difficult um, after that. Hepatitis A virus, just last year, um, we had an issue related to the consumption of medjool dates. Sainsbury's and Marks and Spencer's both did a, a recall um, of that product. Actually, at Camden BRI, we did some investigative work for the UK HSA and did actually find um, we were able to manage to detect the hepatitis A um, from uh, the dates from, uh, that had been left over from people who were hospitalised in, in that particular outbreak. So there was a definite link there. Um, and that uh, a similar outbreak happened in Australia, in New South Wales. Um, related to medjool dates as well from the same area. So again, global food supply chain, you can see how that's uh, causing issues. Hepatitis A outbreak in Norway as well. Source remains unknown for that one, but that was in, in fruit. And also, we also know that the pork industry has been hit very hard by the media. Um, we had um, lots of issues with regards to um, headlines a few years ago with uh, when uh, sausages were found to contain hepatitis E. Um, and the pork industry has had several issues with related um, to uh, other issues as well. Um, so they've been hit particularly hard. So how can we go about testing and control of these viruses? Well, the first rule is to know why you're doing the testing. It's the first rule in doing any testing, really, any microbiological testing. Know why you're doing it and what to do if it's positive. 
The presence of genomic material, of course, doesn't necessarily mean that an infectious virus is present, but it, it could be non-infectious, it could be damaged. However, it could equally be an infectious virus particle. So you should be concerned if you find it on a raw product, if it's untreated, especially a transmission route there has been identified. Somehow it's got into that supply chain. What would be done if another pathogen type was found? You know, it's not that difficult to work out what to do. If a salmonella was found, what would you do? Shut down the line, do a deep clean. You have to do the same type of thing with the virus. Check compliance with HACCP procedures. Guidelines, look at guidelines. Staff health monitoring, has anyone been sick lately with viruses? Look at your hand washing procedures, effective disinfectants, are they being used? Will these um, kill bacteria? A lot of um, obvious, um, you know, uh, focus has been on COVID-19, people checking disinfectants to make sure that works against COVID-19. Is the same being done for these other virus types. But consider validating your cleaning procedures or other control measures that you have in place to reduce contamination, perhaps bacterial contamination. Does that also reduce viral contamination? We can help you check that. Consider setting up a monitoring program for detection of viruses in at-risk foods. So testing is certainly not the only way to control viruses or look for, you know, look for ways of controlling virus, but it is one way to monitor the effectiveness of existing control measures. At Camden BRI, um, we, we um, have been doing this for some time. We've been UCAS assessed since 2018, um, and we're currently the only lab providing UCAS accredited testing of fresh and frozen produce. We have a lot of, as I say, a lot of years of experience with this, and we can work with our members and customers to help overcome problems. We've done lots of types of um, matrices at Camden BRI, a lot not included in the ISO scope as well. We've looked at pineapple chunks, dates, dried herbs, seaweed salad, all these types of things which are quite difficult to look at. Or if you want to see if your control measures that you have in place are actually working for viruses. Well, because it's very difficult to work with target viruses, you it's hard to look at um, the, the control measures, as I say, because you can't culture them, but you can use surrogate viruses. MS2 um, is a very good norovirus surrogate. So these are viruses which infect bacteria, and they offer a method that you can use to analyze if food safety and environmental control measures are effective against infectious non-enveloped viruses like norovirus. We've done things that can assess the persistence of viruses of, on surfaces and in foods. We can look at the effect of intrinsic food parameters, pH water activity, the effect of extrinsic control measures, look at heat treatment, UVC um, treatments, fresh produce disinfectants, and in fact, the effectiveness of disinfectant measures themselves, both on surfaces and in the air. It's a biosafety level one organism, so it's very easy to use compared to the actual target viruses themselves. So that means that we can carry out not just lab-based, but also come to your site and check your cleaning regimes, for example, validating them using this organism. So if that is something that uh, you want to consider, please do get in touch. So conclusions. Um, norovirus, as we have seen, has been ranked as the number one issue in regards to foodborne disease by the UK Food Standards Agency. Yes, there is um, a, a better awareness of viruses in general, especially because of COVID, but not necessarily for these ones that we've just talked about. There's still a lack of awareness generally in the industry, industry and how to control these viruses. I mean, you can ignore it, but that's a big gamble. Outbreaks occur, nobody wins as a result of that gamble. The perception is that few illnesses um, can come from fresh and frozen products, but we know that's not true. A lot of problems um, are highlighted in fresh and frozen products from salmonella, E. coli, listeria, et cetera, but also from these viruses. We know that there are knowledge gaps, still a lot, you know, there's still lots to learn, still much to learn about hepatitis E virus, and the control measures that might be put in place for that. Guidelines are there, but in general, um, they don't have enough specific information to counteract virus contamination risk. 
Most HACCP procedures are based solely on bacterial characteristics, which don't necessarily work for viruses. There's no clear guidance really on actions to take when viruses become a problem. So it's recommended that, the, that you review your risk assessments and your food safety management plans include viruses there as hazards. Cruise ship industry, we know, are plagued by um, these types of outbreaks. They have excellent guidelines. Why can't the food industry do the same thing? Testing can help. It expedites duty of care. So if you're saying that you're providing a, a safe food or a safe food as possible, you should be looking at viruses as well. And that can provide knowledge for you as well in advance of potential problems in supply chains. In addition to that, it builds up a library of data that can inform potential control strategies down the line. And then as we've just mentioned, validating cleaning regimes and disinfectants used also provides you with assurances that all is being practically done to ensure that you have a safe working environment and that not only includes the food, but also your workers as well. So thank you very much. That concludes my presentation. Uh, I look forward to any questions you might have. That's great. Thank you, Martin. Uh, that was a fascinating overview, I suppose, of, you know, the, ma the major foodborne viruses. Um, and I think it will have been very informative for everyone. I think we do have a number of questions in the Q&A box. So, you know, if anyone else has any questions, please do put them in and, uh, and we will get to as many as we can. Um, I will just take a look at the first questions there. We have a question on the curing of meat, for example, salami. Does that eliminate the risk of hepatitis E virus in the food in any capacity? Does it go any way to, um, to controlling the virus in the food? The short answer to that is we don't know um, completely. Okay. As I say, there's still lots of knowledge gaps there. But um, generally, as with most things, it's, it's heat treatment that will um, eliminate um, this type of thing and this type of food product. Um, so because these things are mainly eaten raw and the fermentation process doesn't include heat, uh, as I say, that's still, you know, a bit of lack of knowledge there, but, uh, you know, the risk is that, um, you know, fermentation doesn't necessarily do anything. You know, the, the acids in the, in the foods, etc., doesn't necessarily do anything. So, um, and, and also in these types of products, you, you may well have um, high fat content, you know, high protein content, which may well protect the viruses as well. So there's protection factors going into con consideration there as well. Until we get um, to a point where we've got a, a reliable cell culture infectivity assay, as I say, it's very difficult to um, completely answer that question. Okay, great. Thanks, Martin. So I think we don't think we can assume any protection from the, the fermentation process then. So I've got a number of questions now from um, one of our attendees um, about hepatitis E viruses can, can be transmitted in food or after consumption in the body. I'm not sure I fully understand that question. Um, so if, um, if you mean the... Uh... Yeah, they can be transmitted through the foods, as I say. So, um, so anything that has become contaminated uh, and contains it, and if you eat it, um, you know it will um, potentially cause an infection. As I say, a lot of the um, infections may be asymptomatic, which means that you won't necessarily know you have it, but you will still be shedding that virus. So yes, it will come out of your body and be shed mainly in your feces. Um, but in the case of um, have, yes, that'll be in the, in, the, in the feces. Okay, great, thank you for that. Um, how different new viruses can be growth or and growth of viruses such as coronaviruses? It, I'm not sure if this is about, you know, culturing viruses or growing them in the laboratory. Um, or I'm not quite related. sure I understand the question, how different new viruses can be grown. Such as, I mean, yeah, I, emerging viruses, yeah, there, there's bound to be more that crop up. So, um, you know, as they do, there will always be research into um, infectivity assays. So 
working out ways of growing them in the laboratory is key to be able to understand the control measures necessary um, to eliminate the virus or put it to safe levels. So yeah, it's um, coronavirus was a, a classic example, you know, and because that one was a containment level three virus, you know, um, any lab handling that or wanting to yes. culture it, it wasn't so easy because you have to mm. do that in a containment level three laboratory and there's not that many of them around. So you'd need specialist facilities, you need specially technically trained uh, staff members to be able to handle those viruses, um, especially if they are of a higher biocontainment level. Absolutely, okay, thank you. And there's another question there relating to whether there's a trigger in certain cells gen for the generation of viruses. So yeah, I mean, looking at the, in, you know, what actually yeah, happens the in the cells. cells. Yeah, I mean, as far as I'm aware, um, they, there are particular cells um, that each virus will need to latch on to. And, um, you know, obviously it has to get into the, the digestive system and go through your stomach and all the rest of it. Um, and, you know, for norovirus, I believe it's in the small intestine, it can latch on to cells within there. Um, so it has to go through all that system first. Um, and for the hepatitis, uh, you know, it, it has to go through the, uh, the gland from your, your stomach into the, into the liver to cause the infection. So, yeah, it's, um, it, there's um, definite um, pathways within the, the body that it has to go through first before it, it causes infection. I don't know if that answers the question or not. But. Yes, I, I'm sure it does. If anybody, if we haven't understood your question properly or you want to clarify anything, you can pop another question in the Q&A box um, and we will take a look at that. And then looking at um, ISO or HACCP food safety precautions, are they enough? I suppose looking at the control of viruses are, you know, what we have HACCP in place in food businesses um, would be enough to control them? As I say, probably generally not because they're looking at bacteria um, and the differences as I've mentioned are quite significant uh, the studies that we have done especially in the in the in the novas um, study the norovirus attribution study we also um, you know that was a big survey done um, of over a thousand samples we also looked at um, the presence of e coli in these samples and there was no relation between the presence of the bacteria and the presence of the virus. So you can't assume that you're you know, monitoring for you know, um, fecal contamination as shown by presence of bacteria will tell you if you have presence of virus or not. And I think that's one of the main problems. Okay, yeah, that is an interesting point because we would kind of assume maybe if we were yep. monitoring for fecal contamination that that would kind of cover off yep. um, the viruses. So um, that's an important point, I think. And um, we have another question there about sewage treatment. You know, can is there a way of treating sewage effectively, for example, UV? Um, I that I'm not sure of. Um, I, sewage is. Um, got several stages obviously um, before it gets released in, into the water course. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I, I do know that UV um, obviously gets used to treat uh, drinking water, but I presume there's an issue with um, any sediment that may be present and, and causing shadowing and not being able to penetrate the, mm. uh, the, the liquid, you know. Um, so I guess it can do, but I, I don't know at what stage that gets done. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, and now there's another question here asking us about any Irish data on food or environment viral load. I'm not sure, Martin, as you're not working in Ireland, whether you have any information. Um, where... I'm not sure, but, I, but the FSA Ireland, um, I'm sure, have produced reports. Yeah, they are, there yeah. are reports out there. There's certainly, I think the Marine Institute do a shellfish mm. monitoring program, you know, that looks at viruses, norovirus there um, in oysters. So 
Um, and I do think Department of Agriculture do look at the hepatitis mm-hmm. E. I'm, I, you know, I'm not sure the extent <clears throat> of the of the monitoring and how much data is there, but there are certainly, you know, um, agencies here, and as you mentioned, the FSAI also will be. Mm. Um, monitoring data on uh, on viruses and then advising on uh, yes. on controls. Okay, so now we have a question about washing berries with a mixture of water and white vinegar, that this is a thorough deep clean way to wash them and would this affect the presence of viruses on the surface of the fruit? Well, unless you have a standard method of doing so, um, it, it may well do, but um, unless we do a particular study where we test that. Um, th- there may be a paper out there that um, has looked at this. I'd, I'd have to look into that, but um, short answer again, don't know. As I say, it, uh, if that was relied upon, it would have to be done in a very standardized way with a particular mm. type of vinegar, you know. Um, but yeah, in, in general, the washing of the vegetables is relied upon by, uh, you know, the producer, by to the consumer to do, you know, and most people will wash it under a tap. They won't go to any bother of mm. doing anything else, I guess. But um, I know that people have um, considered, you know, uh, the presence of like salad dressings and things that may uh, help to inhibit uh, the infectivity of viruses. So it's, um, it's certainly something that, uh, that, might work but it needs again more study okay great thank you for that um and now we have another question oh this is, refers to the fsa i do not advocate the washing of fresh produce such as lettuce etc using chlorine tablets mm. <coughs> so the risk associated could be managed by thorough washing with potable water in appropriate washing facilities in the kitchen so that's just what you've been mentioning there is there yeah. an argument then that chlorine tablets or sterilizing fluids can be ben- beneficial in reducing viral load for washing ready to eat veg and fruits especially in a setting where high risk individuals Okay, so are served such as hospitals and nursing homes. Mm. Well, I, I do know that um, hospitals and nursing homes, et cetera, have specific suppliers um, who have very strict regimes in place for, um, for their food supply. Um, but in terms of, yeah, I mean, chlorine, I know that uh, the industry is wanting to move away from the use of, of chlorine. Mm. Um, I mean, in an industrial process, chlorine is used mainly to keep the the wash water clean um now obviously that may well have an effect on the reduction of bacteria and pathogens including viruses but again that's not the main um, purpose of adding the chlorine to the the wash water it's mainly for keeping that wash water clean because of removing debris and potential bacterial buildup in the water rather than on the surface of the vegetables I see. Thanks for that, Martin. I hope that answers your question. And then there's a request there about sending on the recommended report. I presume that's the FSA report. I think we can include that in the when we send out the um, the links to the recording. Mm-hmm. So yes, we will make note of that. Um, and then we have another question here that's just come in. How do businesses eliminate or control viruses naturally, not using chemicals other than washing hands? Washing hands is the most effective way, by far. Mm. Um, as we have been drilled into us the last couple of years for coronavirus, you know, um, washing your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap and water, it's good for coronavirus, it's good for norovirus. Um, the use of gels and things, you know, um, has been widely <clears throat> supported for coronavirus, but that won't work necessarily on mm. norovirus, that they're not susceptible to, to alcohol disinfection. Um, so that's been a bit of a, a quandary for people, I guess, you know, they're, they're thinking that um, gels you know, are okay for disinfecting hands when it comes to these other viruses, but they're not necessarily. Um, but no, that, that, that is certainly the, the best protection factor, but also just raising awareness as well, mm-hmm. training training of staff, making them aware of the issues um, and specifying viruses and how they can, how they differ from bacteria and how they can be transmitted so much more easily. 
Um, you know, that's that's the challenge, I think, is to just be more aware um, in general of, of viruses. Uh, yeah, and as I say, making sure that the disinfectants that you do use for cleaning actually work. Um, you know, th there's been lots of technologies talked about over the years. Some of them are like uh, cracking a nut with a sledgehammer, you know, like really big things, but basic good hygiene is the yes. best way to control it. And I would imagine as well, people, you know, food handlers not coming into work when they've been ill and following all of those exactly. um, guidance and things like that would be really important as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yes, thanks for that, Martin. And now there's a question about testing, on, carrying out tests on foods for viruses in Ireland. Well, I think we mentioned the shellfish monitoring program. Um, I think there are, well, we have the virus reference laboratory in UCD. I'm not sure if they're doing food testing at the moment. Oh. Um, and I was aware that the public health laboratory in, I think, in Cherry Orchard would do, had started doing some testing for, on, um, for viruses in foods, but I, I'm not familiar personally with, you know, how much oh. and what viruses it's specifically they are testing for. Um, but if anybody else has more information, just pop it into the Q&A box or the chat for us um, and let us know. Yeah, and, and just in relation to that, I know that, uh, uh, you know, as I say, there's very few labs that, that, that do it. I think we are the only ones, as I say, in, in the, uh, well, in Scotland, England anyway, that I know of that, that do testing for viruses and fresh produce. Um, but there are other labs, of course, that do um, testing for shellfish. CFAS is the National Reference Laboratory for Shellfish Testing. Um, and uh, yeah, there, there are just very few places that, that do it. I mean, the, the, the UK HSA, their food and environmental laboratories don't, don't mm, do food testing. No. no. Um, which I guess is why they came to I, yeah. us for the, the hepatitis A issue. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, I suppose so. Yeah. And it's, um, I suppose if you come back to then the testing, and I suppose it applies to, to bacteria as well, you know, between whether you're testing for using a molecular method and you're testing for the nucleic acid and what implications that has for whether there is, you know, an actually infectious agent, you know, active in the in the product. And yes. you know, that throws up questions, I think, for people too. Yep. Okay, um, I think that's all. The questions that have come through the Q&A box anyway okay. so we will wrap it up we've gone a little bit over time Martin so thank you. you've been very generous with your expertise and your time this morning right. we really appreciate it um, just to say I know that uh, Tracy mentioned she will be circulating we will be circulating a link to the recording 